X-Men, the animated show that ran 1992 to 1997, review. I'm going to start by telling you this was a show I absolutely loved. This video will have some jokes, and we'll get into some serious topics. Now, if you're looking for a review that says stuff like, the movie doesn't really hold up, it's been outdone by later productions, because of that, it's not that much fun to watch today. Whether you agree with that assessment or not, this is not that review. And I realize this video is long, I'm doing what I can to make it worth your time. So, before I go into it, the top link in the description box will allow you to donate to the SAG After Strikers. Please do so. This is an extremely important cause. And then there are a bunch of links to videos that help explain why this is so important. Now, this video is a review. I don't intend to spoil anything. If I end up deciding I will, I will verbally warn for it to so hold up an index finger until I'm done with the spoilers. You can mute and skip ahead and choose even lower my index finger. And uh, if you want my spoiler filled thoughts on episodes, the link to them will be in the description box. So I have watched every episode of this at least twice uh, once back in you know the early 2000s that they I, I don't I'm almost certain I did not catch this on its initial run but they re-aired it after the success of the first X-Men movie and that's when I watched it and I have also watched you know over the last several months whatever over a while, I've watched all episodes, you know, one or two per, yeah, and occasionally three per day leading up to making this video, and I just got done watching the finale. I've also read a number of the comics. Uh, I, I read comics fairly regularly between 1999 and 2007. So, plot. Present day, the adventures of the X-Men, a team of young mutants, a.k.a. humans with superpowers. And... Let's see. Yeah, so... The... This has a very strong pilot. It's a two-parter, and it really introduces you to the, the themes, the concepts, the main and major characters... You know, not not every single major character, but every main character for the rest of the show, and shows the kind of action that the the show excels at. the The finale was not in, intended to be the finale, as far as I can tell. The you know they had they would have liked to keep the show going, but it ended up getting canceled. Despite that, the finale is actually pretty good. Um, yeah, I don't want to spoil anything. I'll just say, yeah, it's a, um, and and they are now supposedly there will be, and and honestly, that's part of why I did the show now. Supposedly there will be a, you know, they're they're follow they're they're doing a follow up to the show on on Disney Plus. Now, this and Batman the Animated Series are my favorite Saturday morning cartoons until Clone Wars premiered. I love how much empathy this show has and inspires for minorities, including LGBTQIA, since mutants are stand-ins for IRL minority groups. It's something you realize when you become a teenager, even if you didn't know before, so that fits really well for the LGBTQIA in part about trans and intersex, as well as non-whites, plus sides, etc., through the ones who are identified as mutants by the way they look. Some of them have no choice but to look that that way, like the blue-skinned furry ones. Some of them feel more confident looking like that, and since they're not hurting anyone, they should be allowed to live like that. The show very effectively communicates to a young audience that being a member of a minority can feel very alienating and threatening, of course, in the show, it's not so much metaphors. Literally, there's people who attack you for being a mutant. And how much found family can help. How important it is to accept yourself and not try to reject your identity. Some of the characters on the show that struggle the most with like personal issues are the ones who try to 
find some way around it to to reject their identity and the show really does well at expressing the reality that that's only going to lead to pain as as difficult as it can be it is extremely important to accept who you are there are realistic interpersonal relationships between the various characters based on their personalities backgrounds and such and some of it is outright interpersonal conflict all the mutants use their powers well, and it feels logical who goes on missions and such. No one is just in the background, like sometimes happened in the live-action movies. I will be making a couple more uh, comparisons to the live-action movies. Great cliffhangers when it cuts to commercial and at end of certain episodes. The show communicates to young audiences that sometimes breaking the law is the ethical thing to do, and will prevent harm, not cause it. The series shows how common and uninformed bigotry can be, and often is, respectively. Slavery is called out with details like the harsh punishment, including execution for trying to free yourself and other slaves, how horrible it is to be a slave, how badly slaves want to be free, and it's shown that slavery is not some abstract dead thing, it is a tool of those who choose evil to control control everyone else, a blight on humanity. Like the movie, sometimes characters who are powerful enough to solve a situation will be temporarily taken out of situation so that every you know everyone ends up being necessary and gets to show off and or at least gets to show off. The show communicates that sometimes bad things come from good intentions. Not everyone is actually bigoted towards mutants. Some people just don't understand how to help them and screw up in their attempts. And the the character that the kids are most meant to see themselves in is Jubilee, and her power, fireworks from her fingers, is a good control for lose metaphor for losing control of your temper, which does happen to a number of teenagers and not only girls. Jubilee is supposed to be the character that young audiences can most easily relate to, and as such, she is the most annoying character. See also Wesley on Star Trek: The Next Generation. And the that kid from the the protagonist kid from Last Action Hero, it doesn't suffer from the kind of bad writing that you would get on at least some. I don't know if the the if it's like overwhelming, but I hear that it is. I only recall like four episodes clearly. Episodes of the 1987. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, which was a show that was primarily made to sell toys. They developed the toys, then they had to write episodes, you know, you had a, you had some people, to, you know, making toys, figuring these are gonna, like, be really appealing, these are gonna be toys that kids are gonna want to play with, they might, you know, they might not even need to watch the show if they just see this design hanging on, you know, on the wall of the toy store, they're going to bug their parents to, into buying it. And then other people had to try to write stories that justified those toys. And this show, X-Men, much like the comics, are not really trying to directly sell something. Other than just the next issue, the next episode. And yes, this does of course mean that some stories in the comics get drawn out much longer than they should. I wouldn't really say that happens on this show. It also really helps for me personally that the cast in a lot of episodes is the same. Like, there will be guest stars, sure, but there isn't, like, yeah, there, there's not really a, a huge chunk of the show where someone that's been established as this is a regular character just, like, disappearing like there's not everyone is in every single episode and and they don't always explain it sometimes they do but yeah you know I love the Clone Wars but sometimes I would get frustrated at entire episodes that didn't have one of the characters that I had really grown to care about on this show the settings change countries savage land outer space and the storylines very greatly but the main cast remains for those other changes and this is also something that you know some sometimes you know one of the one of the characters storm is originally from africa so you know if they're dealing you know yeah hypothetically if they go to africa or a place that is similar you know she's going to say oh this is like home and other characters are going to go to her for advice 
you know, and yeah, I, I think that works really well. It, the, the show adapts a number of beloved storylines from the comics and does a really good job. Some stuff is toned down since it's supposed to be possible viewing for a somewhat younger audience. A lot of the comics are basically for teenagers. And the show, you know, like hypothetically, a seven-year-old could watch it. And there is stuff that appeals mainly to those. And, you know, I, I can imagine some teenagers would probably be annoyed like there's quips in in this and in comic books but a number of the quips here can be kind of corny and, and goofy and you know and it, yeah the the for for those who might not know like in comics like Wolverine will actually stab someone there will actually be blood you know the the in in general there can be a, you know, a lot more violence and a lot more. It can be much more direct, and and such. And the the show tries to avoid that. This show has an amazing opening theme tune. Honestly, I'm not sure a bad one exists that uses electric guitar, but even so, it may well be my favorite. It may actually top Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Skills and Warriors, maybe even Mighty Morphin Power Rangers. Okay, nothing tops. Mighty Morphin Power Rangers theme tune, but it's my favorite animated show theme tune. The intro gives a brief introduction to every major X-Men. We see them in action, can deduce at least some of their powers. We we get their name, you know, and it's going to be difficult to find a kid who at all enjoys Saturday morning cartoons who won't feel compelled to watch the show for at least one of these characters. And this is one of those IPs that do really well with animation. The action settings and special effects don't have to be limited by a live-action show budget and schedule where they have to physically produce all that stuff. Not that animation is easy, but for this it's much more, you know, it's, it's much less time-consuming. The central cast of X-Men has Jean, Storm, Rogue as the three women. Right, Andrew Lee. As, uh, yeah, the four women, and one of whom is black, Cyclops, Wolverine, Gambit, and Beast, as for men, and Xavier, the team leader at base. So, yeah, like, pretty much equal when it comes to representation of male and female. I would love more diversity of ethnicity, and it would have been great to have more when it comes to open LGBTQIA representation. But there are... Same... Yeah, there there are at least two characters that are established to be a sapphic couple. And, you know, it is important to, to keep in mind, you know, back in 92, it was much, much harder to put LGBTQI representation on screen, especially for something, you know, partially aimed at, at kids. And, you know, the themes do a lot to, to make up for that. But I... Nevertheless, I understand anyone who's frustrated with that. And the show explores different aspects of bigotry, legislation, the courts, if you're on trial and you're a member of minority. The values of the good guys communicate to the audience that it is okay to be frustrated when a member of a minority does the wrong thing, but it's important to understand them. It doesn't make you automatically bad to have done something bad. When they do something wrong, it's usually out of frustration, revenge, or the like. And, you know, there's the old adage, hurt people hurt people. And a lot of the cruelty and violence on the show is in response to other cruelty and violence. And it very often starts with someone feeling disgust or anxiety and taking it out on someone who's innocent. And the X-Men regulars have varied personalities, letting kids know it is okay for them to be like that too. And it also means most kids will care about at least one of them. You know, it's... it's the, the Any show that focuses on just one person or just a very small group, you know, like I mentioned, the, the key... You know, the X-Men team is basically like eight people plus the one back at base. You know, if you only have, like, one lead or, you know, three or four, 
less, you know, you, yeah, you can't be as sure that everyone watching will be able to relate fully to their personalities. And it does also help say, you know, it communicates that the, the you know, just because you're different from other people doesn't mean you can't still, you know, get along with them and work with them towards a shared goal. You know, there's a number of American TV shows that basically suggest there's one standard everyone has to live up to. If you don't live up to that standard, you're terrible. You're not good enough. And this is a show that goes and says, no, you can, you know, there, there's a... I, you know, I mentioned there's there's really only the one black m main character, you know, but in addition to, to some of them being women, there's other diverse aspects. Several of them come from very different places, you know, a, a lot of them come from America, from different parts of America, but the, yeah, they're, e even so, you know, um, and let's see. Yeah, each character has a very distinct voice, right down to specific slang. Storm is very theatrical. Like one of her first lines is Storm, mistress of the elements, commands you to release that child. Rogue will use southern phrases spoken with a distinct southern accents. Like, you know, at one point in an early episode, she, like, you know, she goes to a place where the bad guys are and starts fighting them, and as they're fighting her, she says, you guys need to work on your hospitality. Gambit will dip into French words uh, every so often, non, frère, not so often that'll confuse anyone, and of course has the Cajun accent. Beast is always quoting Shakespeare and other authors considered intellectual fodder. Uh, you know, at, at one point he, you know, yeah, he says, if you prick us, do we not bleed? Jubilee speaks in teen slang, at least as imagined by a bunch of adults. You know, one of her early lines is, you know, it's... Yeah, she says, does a mole babe eat chili fries? And it's basically supposed to be like the teen version of, is the Pope Catholic? And Cyclops, Cyclops is characterized as being very stoic, but unlike the movies, he's not boring. And they do occasionally have him get into, like, not only verbal, but even occasionally physical altercations with, you know, other members of the team. I felt like that occasionally got pushed a little too far, you know, but it is good to, to send the message that having a temper does not mean you can't be a great leader, it's just important, you know, and they do stress this importance, that you don't let your temper get out of hand. Every time he does get into a, you know, a fight with someone else, you know, Gene or Xavier will tell him, stop that, you know, that this is not constructive. And... The show really underlines the importance of found family, a support network, being stronger together, vital aspects of life as a member of a minority. This is, uh, for example, something that you hear many members of the LGBTQIA plus community express, you know, many of whom are rejected by their biological family. And, yeah, the the um, a lot of the ones who come out on top are the ones who are able to to connect with other members of the community. Jean Grey is characterized as de-escalating conflict between male X-Men and obviously it's a lot of pressure to put on women. It's very gender stereotypical, but it is at least a positive gender stereotype. Like there's a lot of cartoons that will say women are shallow, materialistic, as if men aren't. And the hold on. And if, as if the materialism isn't just part of being a citizen under capitalism, you know, that's encouraged. And a lot of the supposed shallow aspects of women being focused on their own appearance and wanting a man who can support them financially are results of limiting gender roles for women, saying they aren't allowed to be part of the more serious male stuff and that they cannot make their own money, that their value lies in their appearance, 
of course that's going to lead to that kind of thing. So yeah, I greatly appreciate uh, that for for this. Uh, you know, I have not watched very many of the. I'm I'm aware there were various superhero shows in the '60s. I can't comment on the the shows, but I have read some of the comics. And yeah, some of those would have like, oh, you know, women are so obsessed with weddings and just, yeah, very, very frustrating for reasons I've just explained. Most episodes will bring up a character, concept, backstory, element, or the like that is explored later, often in the very next episode. The show took elements of the comics that go all the way back to their original 1963 premiere of the comics, but also stuff from the three decades between that and the show first airing, thus giving viewers both classic material and stuff that's more like the kind of stuff they'd see at the same time, and this is very much a best of both worlds scenario. You know, as someone who's read a number of comics from decades past, they're not all winners. There's a lot of really great stuff, but I'm, I really appreciate that they didn't try to just do every, if, if every episode was one of the comics, some of them would have lost viewers. Let's see. You know, and it's very much, it's the kind of thing where they can, you know, in addition to some rewriting, which in some cases is necessary, you know, one, one, one episode features the first appearance of Magneto, and the show is, as mentioned, set in, you know, set when it first premiered, so, you know, 1992, the first appearance of Magneto was in 1963, so they had to change a few details in order to make that still work. And I really appreciate that they didn't just do it as, like, a flashback episode or something. They, they do a number of flashback episodes, but the, the way that they establish Magneto is, is much... You know, it's exactly the right way to do it for the show. You know, if you read comics, you can accept, sure, this character's been around for 30 years, hasn't really aged, th this whole thing, you know, but, yeah, for the for the show, they, they did it this... And it's also, it means that they can, instead of there being 30 years of history, they, they start with a, a blank slate and build. And, uh, you know, they, they, yeah, they clearly, they went through the comics and they were like, this works, this doesn't work as much. And, you know, f for the comics, like, to an extent, the, the, um, the things that comics did in the 60s in order to get, get positive attention is not the exact same as the kind of thing that you, you know, yeah, that you do for, for this kind of show you know, some some comics from back then, they would introduce a character that you might never see again, and it's just like, oh, you know, this is gonna, if we slap this guy on the cover, people are gonna be like, I gotta see what the deal is with that guy, but then if that guy never reappears in the comics, you know, maybe he didn't take off, maybe they just didn't have more stories to tell, you know, it's maybe not the most interesting thing to do 30 years down the line in a TV show, so instead they focus... There's a lot of recurring villains on this show, and yeah, that works really well. It is also... Because it, you know, came out in the 90s, they did... You know, they wanted to do the, the cross-promotion thing, so they, they didn't want people to pick up the comic book and for it to be alienating if they liked the show. So the, the main team is the same team as in a lot of the 90s books, and same for the villains. And Lindsay Ellis uh, expressed that she f found some of that frustrating. Um, yeah, she wasn't the, the biggest fan of, of some of them. You know, to each their own, mileage may vary. I personally really like the, the 90s villains. Now, since the show is for kids compared to the comics which are for teenagers, even adults, with their level of bloody violence, the action, though plentiful, is bloodless. Sure, Wolverine gets his claws out, but he mostly 
cuts through things adjacent to human or mutant enemies. If he buries his claws in something or slashes something open, it's probably going to be a robot or something. They even added the little things that his claws come out of that are normally just on his costume onto his actual knuckles as well, since he's not always in costume, so that the kids are not shown claws protruding from flesh. And yeah, I acknowledge this is a weird, that like, oh, okay, sure, there's these little housing things for them. Now it's okay for a seven-year-old to watch, you know, metal claws, you know, yeah. Anyway, uh, characters, uh, yeah, often characters will attack in a way that the kids couldn't possibly imitate, so there's not a lot of punching each other, it's more like wrestling, and they'll cause explosions near people or throw something heavy at each other. Guards with guns don't fire bullets, but lasers. And the, yeah, the show has very impressive pacing, moving fast, but not overwhelmingly so. There's not really any waste of time on, on the show. And... Yeah, the, there are so, some episodes, not necessarily like a huge amount, but some where there's like a dozen or more mutants in one episode all using their powers. Well, obviously they can't do this for every single episode, but yeah. And yeah, so I mentioned the pilot. You know, it gives you a very strong sense of the world that it's set in, that being very close to our world. But with mutants and very intense bigotry towards them, the relatively small main team of X-Men on the show means we get to know each of them, limits how much they have to be written out of action scenes like in the films. It also helps that not all of them are in every scene or every mission the way that the movies would often try to do. There's a consistent theme of Rogue getting a lot of unwanted male attention. She'll verbally express she doesn't want it, and when the men refuse to take no for an answer, then she'll punch them or throw them somewhere, conveying the message to children that no means no. And this is, again, the, for, for a very long time, American media would send the toxic message that if a, a guy is pursuing a girl and she says no, that just means you have to keep asking, and eventually she'll say yes. You know, if she wanted to say yes, she'd say yes. And the toned down action also includes that if a character shoots another with lightning bolt or optic blast or the like, it doesn't so much directly injure them as knock them backwards. Sometimes someone is thrown into water and the show makes sure to show they didn't drown. You know, often their head won't even go underwater. There's a, an early episode where someone like picks up a, a vehicle full of people, throws it into water, and just like immediately they pop up out of the water to reassure the kids, you know, because that is the kind of thing that that could get very dark, if not. It does have occasional racism in voice acting for non-white characters with exaggerated accents and, and such. Cyclops is perhaps a bit quick to anger here compared to the comics and to what makes sense for a leader. In general, probably a little too much anger for the male X-Men to make it credible that Xavier keeps them around. He does suggest he'd be willing to kick one out if they go too far. And I, I think this was to, to, you know, there's this idea that little boys are just full of anger. I've always felt they're, you know, they're full of energy for sure. The anger comes if you lie to them and if you tell them that their problems don't matter. Now, let's see. Right, and the and, and I realize this is not an individual problem, it's a systemic one. The sound design for the mutant powers and such is good. Perhaps not amazing, but definitely as good as could be expected for a Saturday morning cartoon at the time. Sometimes people do the wrong thing for the right reasons. All, all, often an understandable reason. Let's see, you could quickly get a sense of the powers of the different mutants, and it tends to be shown rather than told. And this is, of course, you know, in a comic book, when you only have stills, some powers have to be explained, and that's where the, the show being animated, you know, there's a, a number of the powers. I Yeah, a number of the powers are never actually 
explained. They're just shown, and you can intuit, oh, okay, this is this is the exact thing that's happening, and this is, you know, yeah. And Cerebro, which strengthens the psychic power of Xavier and Jean, allows people's memories to be put on a TV screen in motion, which speeds up storytelling. You know, the, um, see, the, there's no need to explain verbally what the psychic scan reveals. And there are some times where a character will, will appear to a new group of people, and we, the audience, already know what this new character's deal is, so instead of, you know, stopping the episode dead and having stuff explained to the characters that the audience already knows, sometimes what they'll do is they'll cut to something happened concurrently that's really important, and then cut back after the explanation has been said. So no time is wasted, and, you know, and without, you know, sometimes they'll just skip a little bit of, of time. To, to get past the explanation. Now, uh, the romance between Gambit and Rogue does suggest the toxic idea that if a woman turns down a man, it just means he should keep trying rather than accept her saying no. And this is, you know, there's a couple of things where the show kind of s tries to say a thing, but accidentally at other times says the opposite. It's not a huge problem, but it does occasionally happen. And ultimately... The, the takeaway for some kids might be that if the right guy keeps asking, then eventually, she, you know, she'll say yes. And this is, of course, not the, yeah. Usually when someone gets hurt, it's torn clothes. There's very little blood or even visible bruises or the like. There are a number of mutants who have super strength, but there's usually something else going on as well, so it doesn't get old. It's not just a bunch of super strength ones going around. There are a lot of quips, many of them with puns or other verbal comedy, and yeah, over the course of the show, we will see aliens, space, not always together, time travel, dinosaurs, and the astral plane, which is a place where psychics can, can fight each other that isn't physical. A number of mutants have telekinesis, telepathy, and other psychic powers, which is true of the comics as well. Sometimes an entire episode will focus on the backstory of an individual character, much like the comics. I really greatly appreciate this. Um, I think the show would be much less than what it is if every episode was just a huge, like, battle, kind of, you know, a, a massive, mind-bending scenario. A number of episodes are very, very small scale and really about, yeah, individual characters. At least one episode is like if the Terminator and Back to the Future Part 2 had a beautiful baby that went to college and majored in mutant-powered action, minored in social commentary, and got incredible grades. On multiple occasions, Wolverine is separated out from the rest, and just like in the comics, those are some of the best stories, so I really appreciate they didn't feel the need to have him always work with the rest of the X-Men, you know, just, yeah, he's, he's, I know, I'm, I'm a cliche, he is one of my favorite characters, you know, he was when I was 13, he still is one of my favorite comic book characters, and, yeah, they, they, you know, they have several stories that use his complicated past, and, yeah, they do phenomenal like many of the movies based on comic books, this uses visual communication to get many things across that in a comic book, because every image is static, you can only do through exposition dumps, sometimes wall of text style. For those who want that sort of thing in their medium, this does feature romance. Certain characters want to marry each other, pursue that. But it does also have several strong women. And, you know, as I mentioned, yeah, basically half the X-Men are women, most of them strong. Jubilee doesn't start out strong. She starts out uh, insecure and, and unable to control her powers, but the other three are. And, you know, there are episodes that let us know they weren't always, you know, so it's not, it's not telling kids, if you're insecure now, you always will be. 
it's telling them, you know, eventually you you can master this. You know, the fact that you feel insecure now does not mean you should give up. Over the course of the show, the universe of it will expand, starting fairly small and accessible, and gradually rewarding long-time viewership more and more. Far into the show, we get arcs as long as five parts that get much more complex and far out than, for example, season one. And apparently a lot of the actors are like Canadians and British and some Americans, so when they do other accents, it's put on rather than natural, and occasionally that really shows. Like some of the Scottish accents are not the best. You don't have to start watching from episode one, but you will probably want to start watching it fairly early in the run, like before season one is over, before the multi-part finale to season one. Because the further in it gets, the more complicated, the more it expects you to already know the world and the main X-Men team and such. And a lot of episodes that introduce or feature new characters will have many of them as more or less background, but if you do get major character exploration, though not always in the first episode they appear in. There are multiple enemies who are powerful people that make slaves of powerful mutants rather than fight for a peaceful coexistence that doesn't subjugate anyone. Each member of the main X-Men team gets exploration, and without spoiling anything, Yes, every single one of them will get at least one episode that is primarily about them and exploring who they are. And many of these separate the character, at least somewhat, from the rest of the team. So you see what they're like when they're not dealing with the other team members. There's excellent exploration of the harmful effects of patriarchy on men, not only women, through the character of Wolverine. Uh, young man, a young white man who does sometimes manage to be stoic and is rewarded for it, but other times struggles to contain his anger, rarely express, expressing tender, positive, feminine coded emotions. Uh, you know, you know, he as a man is discouraged from showing these, so he bottles them up until they lead to violence. Sometimes, and and he is ultimately a positive character. So that can tell young boys struggling with this, you know, you're not a failure, you know, you can still go and do great things. Sometimes episodes will feature psychic attacks, even battles in the astral plane, and otherwise not physically real. There are cyborgs, the X-Men will fight an entire team of superpowered people, juggle all the different powers incredibly well. Essentially, I do recommend at least some of the live-action movies as well. The first two, Days of Future Past, Deadpool's 1 and 2, and Logan. I recommend every episode of this show. Uh, you know, the... the Yeah, I love that every single episode of this show. I, I wouldn't skip a single one. The, especially early, movies are for people who want the intelligent themes but are embarrassed by the comic book connection. The show is for people who are not embarrassed by that connection. Overall, the movies do manage a deeper, more nuanced exploration of the themes. The acting is mostly better not to disparage the voice acting, which is also quite good, often great. The movies don't all manage the glorious comic book goodness that the show is completely saturated in, including the action, which uses everyone's superpowers well and has interesting pairings. Like a lot of the comics and a number of times in live action films, this tend to have the powerful mutants facing off against other powerful mutants rather than simply having really lopsided fights. And and often if the if they're fighting humans who don't have powers, the humans will have guns, you know, military equipment and or be in like a group. You know, there's not a lot of episodes where a mutant just beats up one person who doesn't really have much in the way of, of weapons or equipment. Like quite a few comic books, there is technically eye candy of both sides of the gender binary. It does, of course, matter greatly that so many of the women are heavily sexualized, since historically women have not been allowed more than being objects, including sexually. And it is also, it is a show that acknowledges female sexuality as well. The, the women express, you know, not like, you know, again, 
it's it's for kids it'll go over most of their heads their reflexes are not going to be fast enough to catch it but yeah the 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 women do express desire towards some of the the men and again you know occasionally women any goofiness, silly, silliness, and childishness is to a significantly lesser extent than something like the 1987 Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, at least the early seasons. I'm not sure I've ever seen the, the later ones, Red Sky ones. A number of the times there are love stories, and yeah, an, a number of those end tragically. The Disney Plus ordering of episodes does put some of them oddly, chronologically, out of order. There's at least one case where one episode features flashbacks that are then shown for, you know, a, the first time in an episode that is shown later. Many of the mutant characters have been rejected by the non-family... Uh, yeah. Um, their own family members, and that's a big part of why they're violent. There's a solid holiday special episode. I did not think that I, I had forgotten about that one in the years, but it's it's fantastic. Some of the main X-Men team members are actually complicated, have done really bad things, and if you read the comics, you saw them do bad things before they reformed and joined the X-Men. On this show, when we first meet them, they are X-Men, and we might see them do a lot of good before we get an episode that features flashbacks that reveals they used to do bad. Now, I don't know if the following is why, but certainly it does have the effect that since this is a kids show, you're, you know, you ensure that the kids watching already like a character before learning that the character is capable of doing something bad, rather than potentially souring a character for the viewer that they're then stuck watching, unwilling to accept that they have redeemed themselves. And a number of specific major characters and or their worlds have light motifs that help ground their stories. And it's especially effective when some of them cross over with each other, which, yeah, that does happen. I really appreciate that Xavier's superpower is essentially therapy. Like he, you know, like with telepathy, you know, like hypothetically, he could take control. You know, he can, he can do the pose and completely control someone else's actions but usually what he does is try to calm them and you know yeah treat their their psychological issues and yeah this can help you know normalize therapy and it's extremely important you know many people need therapy and there should be no shame in it if you watch the movies, you pretty much have to watch all of them and start at the very beginning. I mean, technically, it is possible to only watch the younger cast ones, but if you want to get very much out of any Wolverine solo movie made after Origins, you pretty much have to watch the original three. This show, however, while there is ongoing continuity, if you simply don't want to watch all of it, you can basically just watch the stuff you do want. You know, it's, like, for sure, you you probably don't want to make it the first If you've never read a comic, if you're not really familiar with, you know, don't start with one of the major arcs, you know. But, you know, as, as long as you're okay with the idea that if you, if you only watch specific episodes, not the entire run in order, then there's going to be certain characters that you're just not going to know what their deal is. You know, if that doesn't bother you, it is absolutely possible to to follow, which, again, like, I... I don't know, I kind of would be fascinated to hear someone... You know, if, if the following is you, please, you know, go to the comments, let me know what was it like watching the Wolverine or Logan without having watched the original trilogy because that I mean I can there's probably at least one person out there and it must have been very very confusing to to you know all these these references to important events that aren't really explained in detail and just yeah 
but but yeah, you know, um, maybe you only really want the Wolverine-centric stories. Maybe you dig time travel. Maybe your thing is Apocalypse. Maybe there's like two or three comic book stories, even arcs, that this adapts, and you really badly want to watch those adaptations but nothing else. You know, yeah, you absolutely can, especially now that it's all on Disney+. Plus. You wouldn't be paying for an entire season set just to watch a few episodes. This is very much the kind of show that benefits from streaming. You know, there, there are some shows where it's like, I mean, you'll want to watch the entire... Like, I don't have access to... I, I forget, what is it? Paramount Plus? The, the one that has Star Trek. I'm really glad that I own the entire Deep Space Nine. I, I have all seven seasons on DVD. I can't even imagine watching only part of that show. I, I know, some people say... Skip the first three seasons. I disagree. But this show, you know, yeah, absolutely. There's some that are just, you know, honestly, there's some episodes I can imagine probably saw a boost after, you know, a major element of that episode, maybe a character, maybe a setting, was featured in one of the movies. You know, some of them in the X-Men movies, in the Fox X-Men movies, some of them in, in the MCU the show is definitely, at times, a soap opera. There's at least one love triangle. There's a wedding episode. You know, there are people who love each other but can't be together, often for sci-fi reasons. And, of course, some major reveals. And one of them even prompts a character to acknowledge. You know, I, th I think the exact line is, talk about soap opera. Talk about your soap operas. I... I think an argument could be made that Gambit does become a bit of a clown, a character we laugh at more than cheer on in some episodes. I wouldn't really say that happens for any other character that we're supposed to respect. There's a couple of characters that we're never supposed to respect that are just comic relief. And in my opinion, they tended to choose ones that weren't... Like, I, I didn't really feel like they took characters that were like, okay, this is an amazing character, this is such a complex character, don't just make them the comic relief, and then turn that into the comic relief. You know, maybe some will, will disagree, but that's definitely, you know, there, and there are characters that, like, hypothetically, you would think, you know, that's a that's kind of a silly character, you know. And and Gambit, he's not always, uh, you know, a, a clown, and, and especially in a lot of his early episodes, he isn't. And I know people who love the comics, who love the movies, who have never been able to take his character seriously. And, you know, it is the kind of, like, I think every comic book character, to some more than others, every single comic book character, and many of the concepts in general, settings and, and such, if you aren't willing to go with it, if if you don't think that that's hypothetically, you know, cool, it's just not going to be for you. And, you know, Gambit, like, his power is that he can, you know, he, he, his weapon of choice is throwing cards. He can charge them with energy so that they're essentially, like, grenades or something, you know, and he can he can throw it directly at a person, he can throw it at their feet, he can use it to blow holes in in stuff, you know. Yeah, if you think that's silly, yeah, you're never going to be able to take that character and his power seriously. And I think the show is stronger for largely taking that kind of stuff seriously. You know, it does it isn't constantly cynical and and trying to be cool and and trying to you know there's a lot of cool stuff on it but it's not trying to be too cool to enjoy the the comic book goodness I, again it's absolute like i know people that love the movies that would hate the show and you know yeah it is true that people with superpowers is not the best metaphor for Ethnic minorities, like, mutants are actually dangerous, more so than non-mutant humans, which is, you know, in inherently so, regardless of, of intent, which is not true of, for example, you know, people of color, and it's especially unfortunate because it is a negative stereotype that many in the majority have had about minorities, you know, 
yeah, you know, a, a black people, LGBTQIA+, and, and, you know, I can't help but wonder if there is at least a little of, you know, yeah, some, some of that in the original comics. However unintentionally, you know, I, I think, you know, when, when the original comics were being you know, written and, and, and published, there were still a number of people, and, and to, the, to this day, there are still a number of people who think that black people are inherently more more sexual, which more sexual, more violent, less willing to to do hard work. And the truth, of course, is that none of these are inherent to any specific ethnicity. I, I hate the word race because there's only one human race. However, they were chosen traits of many slave owners. You know, it wasn't that the, the black women were just inherently more sexual, but a number of slave owners decided to rape their slaves. It wasn't that, you know, s slaves were lazy, it's that they were being abused and forced to work harder than was humane. And the... Yeah, it wasn't slaves who were violent, it was slave owners who were violent to the slaves. But, you know, part of white supremacy is that they they lie... The, the Yeah, white supremacists lie about the, the nature of things, which again, not, you know, there's no inherent... Yeah, not, I'm not talking about ethnic, ethnic, ethnic nature, I'm talking about the nature of slavery. You know, you know, if you are, if you choose to engage in slavery, if you choose to keep slaves, you are choosing violence, rape, and, you know, I don't really agree that laziness is a, is a thing, but if anyone's lazy, isn't it the people refusing to work, forcing other people to work for them? And, yeah, you know, and in, in 63, a number of people in the, in the mainstream, even people who had empathy for them, thought, you know, the, the, they, would, they would probably have said, you know, we empathize with, with black people, they have to stop the violence kind of thing, you know, so, yeah, the, the, that is unfortunate, obviously. It is a better metaphor for being a teenager, which originally a lot of the mutants were, like the original X-Men team, Xavier was the only member that wasn't a teenager, and once you become a teenager, you have energy and emotions that you've never had before, and it is important to not let those get out of hand, not let them drive you to, to do things that hurt people. You know, it's a messy metaphor. It's never been a perfect metaphor because the, on the other hand, teenagers are not targeted for discrimination in the way that, you know, people of color and LGBTQIA plus people are, you know, there's definitely things that teenagers are asked not to do that, you know, if you stop and take a step back and think, it's like, why not? It, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be bad if they did that, you know, but they're not being discriminated against systemically the way that actual minorities are. And it also, you know, being a teenager is something that ends, uh, which is not true of the of actual minority, yeah, identities. Now, some, possibly all, of the cast went on to reprise their roles in other stuff, including the pretty good PlayStation 1 game, X-Men Mutant Academy, which was capitalizing on the success of the first movie, which is, of course, why the team is mostly what... Yeah, the team is what it what was in the the comics, you know, which was also what they tried to do with the movie. That you know, you don't need the movie for that. But the villains are the three villains of the first movie, when those were not the only you know the, you could see how they could easily have put others in there. But yeah, they very much wanted to to capitalize on you know and 
yeah, they did they did pretty well. It's not the best beat em up uh, you know tournament game, but it's it's fairly good. You know, Tekken beats it. You know the the I have uh, Tekken three was its contemporary, and that one is the better. Let me just it, yeah, Tekken three is from ninety seven. And the Mutant Academy is from, like, 2001. So, anyway, as well as X-Men Legends 1 and 2, which are excellent. And uh, um, the, the first, I you know, Marvel Ultimate Alliance, I don't know about the second, but, yeah, three really excellent games. And it's one of those things, I kind of wonder if the... If the voice actors, you know, prefer doing like this really serious stuff as this and some of the the game, some some of the X Men Legends games and Marvel Ultimate Alliance stuff, or if they really like being in the booth for a while, just roaring and growling and you know sounding like they've just been hit in the face and stuff like that for for the beat 'em up. Now the the show successfully finds weak spots in even the strongest, most ethical of the good guys, and positive sides to a number of the bad guys, making clear to the audience there's more to people than your first impression. And this is obviously an extremely important message to send to kids because your first impression might not sound very much like the person you're imitating at all. You need practice. And something I do also appreciate, some of the villains are just beyond redemption. They are, they have chosen evil so consistently, they just have to be stopped. And this is, of course, sadly also true of real life. Some people, you you just have to, to stop them, you know, preferably non-violently, but yeah. I'm, I'm not telling any black person that they can't, you know, I, it's... It's not for me to say when they use violence and when not. Now, the, let's see. Right, so some IMDb trivia. This X-Men series is one of the first animated shows to be serialized, with each of the episodes continuing into the next, although most of them also stand alone as separate shows. Let's see. And... Yeah, and and uh, after a certain arc, the remaining episodes that aired were not in the correct continuity order because the bulk of episodes were being animated with many different studios. The writers decided not to continue with linear storylines. Let's see. Many would likely air as soon as they became available. And certain episodes did not air for two years after they should have thanks to animation quality issues. And, let's see. Yeah, character designs and artwork for the series was provided by comic veterans Will Menu, Larry Houston, and Rick Hoberg. The series character designs were based on the artwork of comic book artist Jim Lee's designs from the X-Men comics. The X-Men roster comes from the blue team, with Storm and Jean Grey, replacing Psylocke and Revenge that was featured in the X-Men comic second volume around the time this series began production. The first issue was ranked by the Guinness Records as the best-selling comic of all time. And... Let's see... Right, that is... Right, and and um, one certain character has such a complicated sign for the animators, could not do a 360 degree turn when animating him. And Stan Lee, RIP, was not creatively active with Marvel Comics at the time the series was being produced, so his involvement was not particularly big on the series. He gave some producers notes on the first 13 episodes. And the voice actors were largely from the Toronto theater scene. And... Right, and there's a, a certain group on the show that are in the comics named the Acolytes, but they're never referred to by name in the series because broadcast standards and practices forbade the writers to call them by that name in the dialogue. Yeah, that's... 
pretty silly. Right, and yeah, um, on November 2021, 20, Disney announced they will be rebooting X-Men the Animated Series under the title X-Men 97. It will pick up where the original series left off with some of its original cast returning. Shortly after the series began, a comic book spin-off series, X-Men Adventures, was launched in November 92, adapting the first three seasons of the show. And in April 96, the comics was relaunched as Adventures of the X-Men, which contained original stories set within the same continuity. The comic book lasted until March 1997, shortly after the show's cancellation by the Fox Network. And no, I will not go on, I will not go on a rant about how Fox takes extremely beloved shows, moves them around in the schedule, and eventually they lose so much viewership that they get cancelled. I, I, I will not. Um, let's see, yeah, many of the voice actors from the show also voiced many X-Men characters when they appeared in various Capcom video games. Let's see, and... Yeah, the, the Brotherhood of Mutants in the series takes its lineup from the second group in the comics, which was led by Mystique. And... Let's see. Oh, that's right. As of July 2022, the series is put in story order on Disney+, Plus, meaning episodes that are later that were meant to be after specific storylines are now where the creators meant for them to be. So, yeah, the, apparently that is the, that was the, the choice. And, and it, you know, to be clear, it didn't, like, ruin it for me that certain things felt slightly out of order. And... Um, broadcast standards and practices and asked the writers to change the name of the villain Fabian Cortez to something non-Hispanic because there are no prominent members of the X-Men to provide balance for this type of negative character. Eric Lowell said that was a big deal to the writers since that's the character's name in the comics and pointed out the Spanish conquistador Cortez was not a well-liked man. And that is true. I, I do hope that it didn't lead to bullying of Hispanic kids. Now... During the earliest production meetings, Professor Xavier, Jean Grey, and Beast were not planned to appear in the show. The writers fought for their inclusion, arguing that they had important roles in the X-Men mythos. That is wild. I can even imagine. That, like, they, they're so important to the show. Just, yeah. That's, yeah. Holy crap. Now, let's see. Okay, so I'm not going to read that, but yeah, IMDb Trivia does have a suggestion for what a potential sixth season would have been like. And... Let's see. Right, and... The, the second episode of this show actually has a female American president. And, yeah, you know, yeah, it's, it's wild that we still don't have, that, that, that has not happened in real life yet. You know, hopefully it will at some point if enough people can get over the fact that, oh, you know, when I was a kid or a teenager, there was some women who drew, who said, said and did some, some things that I didn't like, so I don't think a woman should be president. It doesn't make any sense. It's, it's fascinating how misogyny will, will have people defending men who choose evil over the women that they hurt. Now, let's see... Right, and, and in this show, this was actually the first time that the Mutant Cure plot is explored in the franchise. Before Joss Whedon's run of the comic book series, 
or X-Men The Last Stand. Now, let's see. Right, and... Yeah, throughout the series run, producers had to deal... With, sorry, Wikipedia quote. Throughout the series run, producers had to deal with quality control issues, including attempts to cut costs, requests to change the tone of the series to something more child-friendly, as well as to integrate toys being sold into the show. Yeah. I'm, I really admire them fighting that. F f yeah. And and it really is. Like, there's a couple of episodes that I'm sure did well to sell toys, but it really isn't... Like, they're not constantly throwing new designs at, at the, the audience. And, you know, sometimes that can work well. You know, I'm sure there are shows out there that constantly integrate new designs. But... Here, instead, they they maintain this core that you that they use to to explore. Yeah, the series deals back to Wikipedia. The series deals with social issues, including divorce, Christianity, the Holocaust, AIDS hysteria, feelings of loneliness. Television was satirized in certain episodes, and. Let's see. Although the majority of the series stories are original, a number of storylines and events from the comics are loosely adapted in the series. Let's see. And the original opening sequence features the X-Men demonstrating their mutant abilities to a now very distinctive instrumental theme written by Ron Wasserman. This intro is used throughout the first four seasons. A modified version is eventually introduced in Season 5, Episode 1. In this new intro, the beginning of the theme is slightly changed, and something that... Uh, oh, right, right, yeah. And when UPN began airing repeats on Sunday mornings, an alternate credits sequence was used. A high-quality Japanese animated version of the original opening. Right, and uh, I'm not entirely sure why it's not mentioned here on, on Wikipedia, but the, the Season 5 one also has this... You know, the... the yeah, the first four seasons, a lot of the clips are not from episodes... Actually, I guess, maybe none? Possibly no, none of the um, of the clips are from actual episodes. They made specific clips for the introduction. And then season five, the, the introduction... You know, there's still some of the clips that, that don't appear on the, sh on the show, but a lot of the clips are from episodes in the first four seasons, and... I understand why they couldn't have started with this in the, you know, I think an argument could be made for, like, letting people choose which of these two introductions they want to play before each episode, but, yeah, um, it's a really, really amazing intro that they, they have, and, you know, obviously, you know, it could, there, there are arguably some spoilers in there if you, you know, if you haven't watched the episodes before. Let's see, and... In its prime, X-Men garnered very high ratings for a Saturday morning cartoon and received praise for adapting many different storylines from the comics. And uh, Haim Saban credits the success of the series in assisting him to sell his next project to Fox, the live-action series Mighty Morphin Power Rangers, so yeah, very cool. I really loved that show when I was a kid. I'm not sure if I would still... Yeah, and I, I don't really have anything to say about... You know, I think Linkara did a really great review of that first Power Rangers show. I don't... Did he eventually do all of them? I, I think I eventually stopped watching because I really only watched the... You know, I stopped watching his videos because I watched... I, I haven't watched all of the Power Rangers. I, I think I only watched the very first Mighty Morphin Power Rangers. I don't think I watched past that run. But yeah, he did a really great job analyzing. I don't think I really have anything to add to what he said about Mighty Morphin. Now, let's see... Right, and um, 
yeah, the the actress playing um, playing Jubilee on this show will not be reprising her role as Jubilee for the the relaunch. You know, she, she's going to be voicing another character. She asked for Jubilee to be voiced by an Asian actress, which I I have tremendous respect for. Like, if you know anything about voice acting, like people don't usually turn down work unless it's very much like a principled thing and it's absolute it is kind of ridiculous that she wasn't always because the character has always been Asian so yeah but they are thankfully rectifying that now let's see oh, right and you know it's going to be produced by Marvel Studios Animation it will not take place within the Marvel Cinematic Universe now, uh, this series, not the relaunch, was credited for being responsible for the beginning development of the 2000 X-Men film. Fox Kids owner 20th Century Fox was uh, impressed with by the success of the TV show. Producer Lauren Schuller Donner purchased the film rights for them in 1994. The film's success led to the beginning of a film franchise, which includes a series of sequels, prequels, and spin-offs for two decades, up to 2020, when the series came to an end due to Disney's acquisition of Fox, with the character rights reverting to Marvel Studios. And, yeah, it is, and, and you can see why. You know, it's easy to understand why the show was so successful, and why it was felt, there's a live-action movie series here. You know, this is, this we can put this in theaters, and people will pay, you know, yeah. Pay, pay so much money to, to watch, you know, so many people will go to watch these movies that we can make, you know, huge, you know, $100 million blockbusters for this. You know, that's not nothing. There's a lot of TV shows that cannot, you know, yeah, for, you know, for various reasons, they can't quite lead to, to that. Now, I also have some critic quotes. So let's see. Um, yeah, I copied in probably more than I'm going to read. So let's see. Not only one of the best cartoons of the decade, X Men is also widely considered to be the best comic book cartoon ever produced. The opening theme alone is enough to trigger memories of watching the show while munching on a bowl of Cap'n Crunch. But perhaps what's most amazing about X-Men is that after nearly 20 years, it's just as good as you remember it. Uh, that might have something to do with my preference for the Chris Claremont and Jim Lee comics from that time, but considering the writers borrowed heavily from the stories in those very issues, it isn't at all surprising that I feel that way. It's and uh, yeah, the animated series peppered in cameos aplenty. Let's see. And uh, yeah, the you know it became a surprisingly adult read, accurate adaptation of the '90s comic run. It's not that the cartoon wasn't made for kids; quite the opposite, actually, but rather that it oppressed. It addressed some pretty serious issues, like racism, on top of the action and cheesy comedy. Let's see, and... Yeah, some, some people, real, some, some user reviewers and, and such really don't think that the animation is that good. Like, I'll, I'll grant that there are a few, like continuity gaffes and and you know for sure like the the animation is you know you you uh, it's important to remember budget and time constraints this is not as well animated as the the kind of stuff you would get from like theatrically released anime from the same time th theatrically released you know full length disney features from the same time, you know, like, let's see, uh, 92, so we'd be talking like Beauty and the Beast, yeah, there's, uh, this is, this is not 
as well animated as, as that. Now, let's see. In the in the nineties, I I'll admit I'm again stereotypical. I am not that much of an expert on the the when it when it comes to anime, most of what I know is is Studio Ghibli. But let's see from the from the nineties. So it would be stuff like Only Yesterday. Kiki's Delivery Service. I don't think I have watched Porco Rosso. I hear good things. Um, yeah, it is not as well. I am. You know, Kiki's Delivery Service also features flight. Also has like, you know, fur and and stuff like that. This is not as well animated as that, and that's simply not something that was realistic to expect from a Saturday morning cartoon from this time, you know. It would be awesome if it was, but, you know, no. And the the, the fact that they used the, um, what's it called, the same designs helped a lot. They didn't have to change a bunch, they didn't have to come up with a ton of new designs. They, they Most of the characters for this show are from the comics, and they just took the designs from the comics. And let's see. I think that might. Um, right, and the. Yeah. Things are often dumbed down, and sometimes the show is just plain silly. But for the most part, we get complicated characters whose problems run deeper than the fact that they have to fight a giant robot. Let's see. And... Yeah, and, and, you know, from the very start, like, the show is very much about the struggle for mutants to be accepted, which, you know, I hope that the MCU will be able to adapt this, but... It definitely is, you know, something I've always really appreciated about the X-Men franchise. And this is for this series, it's for the live-action movies, it's for the X-Men, certainly X-Men Legends 2. I, yeah, uh, um, I haven't played the, the first one. I do hear good things, though. I'd like to. I'd love to play it. I, I love X-Men Legends 2 and Marvel Ultimate Alliance. Um and not just because of the, the X-Men thing, but, yeah, you know, uh, and, and the, um, yeah, you know, they, they do fantastic, and, you know, it's not there in X-Men Mutant Academy, there's no way for, you, I, I don't know how you would put something like that into a fighting tournament game, you know, but it's something that from right away, you know, each of these have, have really embraced despite the the risk of alienating you know like there's a lot of bigots in the world sadly they feel extremely emboldened today you know and yeah the the MCU has always been much more reluctant to tackle these very alienating issues like you know when when the MCU started they were tackling stuff where everyone agreed like by 2008 Nobody still said it was a good thing for the the wars in the Middle East that America started, you know. Yeah, various... So, so I, you know, I hope that they'll be able to, you know, like the... the and I'm not saying they didn't do interesting things, you know, but the, the mature stuff tended to not be like, strictly MCU, like, Netflix Marvel also managed to, to really explore mature subjects. Now, let's see. I think that might be more or less what I have. Right, um, the, the, let's see. Yeah, one po person points out, uh, you know, the the comics have been credited with dealing with anti-Semitism and the Holocaust, slavery, style structures championing the rights of the disabled, LGBT communities, racist, religious intolerance, 
and the the show manages to serve as an allegory and deals with issues of tolerance with thinly veiled storylines that serve to celebrate diversity and let's see I don't think I want to give away what what I'll say is this show manages to adapt storylines that the ex that the live action movies tried to and really didn't quite get right and this show gets significantly closer to getting it exactly right and you know some yeah um yeah some some people feel they still made too big changes i think the changes have good you know yeah sufficiently good reasons and let's see. right and and one critic said the animation style is enthusiastically busy with lots of ink work and details that look like they sprang right off the page very true and the storylines too stick very close to the source though newcomers may find themselves overwhelmed by the Byzantine plot lines I you know I would say you can if you feel that you know might be the case I think it's worth just watching the show until it gets there or maybe even just skipping those parts because it's not something that's for the entire rest of of the show and it as already mentioned does not start right away let's see and I think that might be everything for the critic quotes and right one final an epic struggle runs throughout X-Men over whether or not mutants are human this cartoon proves that regardless of the powers one may have the being human is about desire and emotion more than it is any trick one can do with their hands or mind and that let's see so the I think I've pretty much said what I wanted to say about the characters actually I um yes I've mentioned the X-Men I am not sure I've really gone into Eric Magnus Lenshare or Magneto a mutant with the power to control metal. He is a very interesting character and he's one of the the he's a major character who is very much motivated by the the pain that was caused by bigots. And there's a he and Xavier are enemies by the cause but they also deeply respect one another and both of them will do a lot to protect the other and and help them when needed and let's see i think that might be about yeah so the I think that is. I copied in a lot of stuff. Here we go. So yeah, um, every single season, you know, throughout is really, really great. Uh, all the season openers, all the season finales. I, you know, certainly there are some filler episodes, but they do tend to, I, I wouldn't say that there's any episode that's just like completely throwaway that's just worthless the the episodes exp, you know not not all of them add to the overall plot the overarching plot some of them are very much like specific 
explorations of specific characters, specific themes and, and conflicts. Now, on Rotten Tomatoes, the overall uh, tomato meter is 85%. The overall audience score is 94. Now, the... Let's see. Yeah, so season one and three are both 100% from the tomato meter. Season five is a 56 for the tomato meter. Uh, season one has a 98 from users. So does season two. Season three. Season four has a 96 percent, and season five has an 82 percent. Wow, it's really just season five that's dragging the rest of anyway. Um, yeah. So the the. Yes, season five was not as well received as the the rest. I I think some of the the best stuff is in in season five, but you know, to to each their own. Um, certainly, it is the the some of the designs are changed in in season five and. That definitely is something that has has bothered some people. I thought they were, I yes, I prefer the original ones, but I, it didn't bother me as much. I thought it would. I I normally it's the kind of thing that would really bother me, but I guess the stories and and acting and writing kept me so engaged that it didn't bother me tremendously. But some of the best stories are actually in in season five but yeah um, and on I am right and yeah Metacritic it oh, that's right there's not enough critic reviews for a uh, rating there are zero critic reviews on but there are 30 ratings by users um, 29 positive, one mixed. The overall, the average score, the, the overall score is 9.7 out of 10. Universal acclaim. So yeah, this is very well received. And, and again, keeping in mind, as I mentioned, the, the show, like hypothetically, this is something that all the, the racists and misogynists and you know transphobes and homophobes hypothetically they should hate the show now and and yet it has such uh, a high rating and yeah there's only two uh, reviews by users on metacritic both positive one gave it a 9 one gave it a 10 and yeah i yeah, most of this I've already gone into. I'll, yeah, I'll briefly say this. This guy um, points out the voice acting is always expressive, never felt stereotypical, bland, or overdone. Very true. On IMDb, it has an 8.4 out of 10, based on 40, 46,000 uh, votes. 28.4. Uh, percent gave it 10 26.2 gave it 9 24.8 gave it 8 11.2 gave it 7 this is this is a very positively received show and and keep in mind you know IMDB let's see when when did IMDB um cuz like the internet was barely around when when the show first um Let's see, when did it first go on? Oh, that's right, they had a, a Usenet group in 1990, moved to the web in 93. Um, okay, I guess it's, it's, is it possible that they, um, yeah, I'm not entirely sure when you could first vote for, for stuff. I guess it's possible that a lot of these votes were actually, wow, I didn't realize it was, IMDb was that, quite that old. Anyway, um, 
let's see, but, but yeah, 3.7% uh, gave it 6, 2.7 gave it 1, so yeah, some bigots did manage to find it. I, I have to be honest, I can't see any reason other than bigotry to give this a 1. Like, you don't have to love it, you can think that it's average, but giving it a 1 out of 10 is ridiculous. Now, 1.5% uh, gave it 5, 0.7% gave it 4, 0 0.4 gave it 3, and another 0 0.4 gave it 2. But yeah, pretty universally beloved. And the when it comes to user reviews, there are 84 or 72 if you hide spoilers. None of them gave it a 1. Uh, one of them gave it a 2 out of 10, 2 gave it 3. No one gave it 4 or 5. 1 gave it 6. 3 gave it 7. 9 gave it 8. 13 gave it 9. 26 gave it 10. So, yeah. Very, very well received. And, yeah. Um, I rate this 8 comic accurate adaptations that explore important mature issues out of 10. And... Yeah, um, the show absolutely holds up the the lessons and the animation really hasn't aged. You know, I, I disagree with those who say that it yeah aged poorly, and I think there's a chance that it will be liked even better in the future. It's much more mature than a lot of recent Marvel shows. Keeping in mind, I do love most of the Marvel output, and. Um, yeah, I usually, for these kind of things, I try to rank the individual seasons, but honestly, I, I think the show just got better and better. Uh, whether we're talking the, the overall seasons, the finale, or the openers, yeah. Um, season one already set a very high bar, and yeah, each season after that just got better and better. So... Um, this is the end of the review. Let me know in the comments what is your favorite, let's see, what's your favorite arc or individual episode? And are you excited about the re relaunch, the, the sequel series? If you like this video, please thumbs up, subscribe, hit that little bell. There should be a link to my main channel page, one to more links to stuff like relevant playlists, a suggested video for you to watch on the screen right about now. I put out one vlog per week reviewing and sharing spoiled thoughts on a movie and one, let's see, yeah, yeah, as well as one talking about a Star Wars thing. These days it's Ahsoka. One vlog talking about my thoughts on the most recent episode that I've personally gotten around to watching of The Bear, same thing for Scream Queens, and yeah, until today I had been doing a daily vlog where I talk about anywhere between, yeah, one and, and like four episodes of this show, but you know, now I've done it all, so starting tomorrow it will be Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., and then I'll I'm not going to do all seven seasons of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. I'm going to do the Marvel TV shows in the order that they first premiered. So I want to say, I think it's like one season of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., then a season of Agent Carter, something like that. You know, the, the same way that they were released. Uh, and, yeah. Um... Recently reviewing thoughts videos tend to come out very similar to this one, but with the thoughts in the same video instead of in separate videos since its running time is significantly shorter than the show. In other words, if you're more videos like this, you're in luck. You can check out my back channel, so we'll catch me next week. I hope you enjoyed watching as I enjoyed watching and recording. I'll catch you next time. Make mine Marvel.